Now before I start with this lecture, I would just like to explain that uh, this lecture tonight is a very important lecture. But it is very contrary to what most people believe today. But it is essential that we deal with this issue or else the deceptions which are around us might become overwhelming. But as from tomorrow, we start with thunderous events. Thunderous events. And if this is a, something which is something that needs to be mulled over and thought over, then that is fine. It's supposed to be like that. Study the scriptures. See if it is so. If it is so, then make it your own. If you have questions about it, ask the questions. But from tomorrow night we are going to deal with issues regarding our time. Very, very important issues. So please don't miss the lectures that are coming from tomorrow onwards. Right, let us say a prayer before we start this evening. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it ha is to have your word so that we can test everything according to the standard that you yourself has placed into the hands of the people. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us through your word even in this day, and that your word is clear, and that it is good for teaching and for righteousness, learning about righteousness, and for knowledge. Help us, Lord, to understand your word better, and may your sweet spirit enlighten our minds. I pray also that you will keep all evil away from us and that your angels will be present here tonight to protect us. In Jesus' name, Amen. The mystic realm of death. This is a subject that is fascinating. You know, I'm a scientist and when you discuss this issue of death, then one wonders what is death. And the only definition that you can find for death is a negative definition. Death is the opposite of life. And what is life? Life is something that is not dead. That's it. You cannot really say what the difference is if you have a cell and you look at the cell. The one is living and one that has just died has exactly the same chemical bases, has exactly the same enzymes, has exactly everything identical except for one small thing and that is, that is dead. And what that difference is, is something that no scientist has ever been able to explain. It's been possible to freeze life and to bring that life back, but it has not been possible ever to have death return to life. Once that is gone, it's gone. And the Lord God formed of the dust of the ground, and formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man received a living soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Is that what it says there? No, nope, it doesn't say that. It says, and man became a living soul. So in other words, if we look at this text, we have two components. There was dust of the ground, that's the matter, the material substance, which by itself has no life. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He gave him life. He gave him that something which made the non-living living. And he calls it then a living soul. So in other words, the combination of dust of the earth plus the breath of life is equal to a living soul. That's the formula for life. Now this breath of life is this a living entity by itself? Is this something that exists in another world, floats around, and is a living, thinking, intelligent entity? Or is it merely the ruach, the fire, the metabolism, that something which makes something alive? 
That's a very important question. Now the Bible says you don't receive a living soul. When this combination takes place, you become a living soul. So breath, neshama, neshama, breath, spirit. Breath of man, spirit of man. So the word breath is often interchangeably used with the word spirit, ruach, spirit. So this breath is something which makes it alive. Now breath, if you think about it in scientific terms, is oxygen exchange. And oxygen exchange in the sciences we call metabolism. So a living cell differs from a non-living in that it has metabolism. There is something happening chemically in there that nobody can duplicate once that metabolism spark is gone. No scientist can create life. He can put all the substances together, but he cannot produce life. So that breath, that metabolism spark is something that comes from God. Every breathing thing. That's exactly what it means. And the word spirit there, Strong's 07307, Ruach, spirit, wind, breath, mind, blast, air, anger, cool, courage, that which makes you alive. This metabolism, this Ruach, this spirit, this breath, this wind. So is it a living entity, this wind, or does the individual, when he is combined with the dust and this ruach, does he become the living entity? Well, the formula said he becomes a living soul, nefesh, soul, life, person, mind, creature, the body, himself, yourself, you become you. That's what it means. There are the definitions, straight out of the Hebrew concordance. So when you are alive, then you are a living nefesh. You are nefesh. You are a living soul. You are the entity. You are not two entities. You are one entity. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou must freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16, 17. Now what does that mean? Does that text mean that on the day that you eat of the fruit, you will be separated and go and live eternally on cloud nine as your spirit? Or does it mean the two will be separated, the nefesh will again disintegrate into the material, and God takes his ruach, his life, his spirit that he gave you, that gave you life, he takes it back, it returns to him, and then what's left? dust. That's it. That's it. And that's very important that we understand this issue. That's what the Bible actually says. But the devil says something else. The devil's lie. You shall not surely die. Genesis 3 verse 4. So, God says you will surely what? Die. And die means not die live, right or wrong, right? But the devil says, no, 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 you will not surely die, which actually means that you will live. Now, in the world today, what is believed? That you die, or is it believed that you live forever? If you've been bad, you go to the hot place. If you've been good, you go to the good place. Isn't that what the world believes? So in other words, it's not so bad, you see, because it's just discarding this body. But I continue to live, so what's the big deal? What's the big deal? I live eternally anyway. But God said you will die. The devil said you will not die. So 
One of them is lying, and one of them is speaking the truth. Romans 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Death. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Even better. So the devil promises that when you die, or when you eat of the fruit, you will not die, you will have eternal life, and you will become bigger and better and greater and like God. So that's really something. And a lot of religions believe exactly that. If you take Hinduism, then you do not die. You just continue in the spirit world, and you return again, and you get better and better and better, and you wipe out the karma of your past, and eventually you reach a state of Godhood, and you become a living God, and you can be worshipped on this earth. They worship them all the time. Isn't that so? So you get bigger and better and greater. My question always is, why is this the living, uh, why are the living conditions becoming worse and worse and worse and worse if they're all getting rid of their karma over all these millions of years and getting better and better and better? They're not doing a very good job of it, are they? I don't think they're doing a very good job of it at all. So, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3 verse 5. So the devil said something, and today the whole world believes the lie, rather believing what God says. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. John 8, 44. Well, the Bible doesn't mince words. As to which one spoke the truth there in Eden, God said, you will die. That means, if life, living entity, consisted of the dust of the earth, and the spirit, the ruach, the breath, the life spark, the metabolic process, God takes it back, then you cease to exist. You die. You're just dust. The devil says, uh, 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 you will continue to live. You will never die. In fact, you will be like God. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Matthew 22:32. Let's read another one. Mark 12, verse 27. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. For he is not the God of the dead, Luke 20, verse 38, but of the living, for all live unto him. Now this is fascinating. So God says that he is the God of the living. Now, he mentions even some names over here. Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. Are they living or are they dead now? <coughs> They're dead. They've died. But God regards them as living. Does that mean that they live as spirit entities now? Or does it mean that in Christ they are alive? In Christ there is eternal life for them. But the question arises, when is that life going to be given them? And the answer that the Bible consistently gives is in the resurrection. The Bible teaches death, but if you are in Christ, resurrection to eternal life. The other systems teach when you die, you have it instantly, and you continue as a spirit. And you live eternally as a spirit. But then there's some teach that when you are resurrected, the spirit has to come back into the body. So it has to come down, and it has to rise again as a body. So how will they live in future as a body again? In the meantime, they live as a spirit, but they never die. It's not consistent with the biblical teaching. But the bottom line is that God does not count those that have died in Christ as dead. He counts them 
as living because in him they have life. Now, Osiris, the god of the dead, Osiris was worshipped not as the god of the living, but the god of the dead. In fact, the greatest thing that could happen to you was to die. Because when you were dead, you were with Osiris. And Osiris was the one who gave you eternal bliss. So Osiris was the god of the dead, as opposed to Jesus Christ, who is the god of the living. Tutmosis III is attributed with the guidebook of the netherworld, the Umdayat, and he is the one who wrote the system on which the Gnostic faith is, is based. The whole Osiris cult that we looked at last night to some extent is based on the god of the dead. So you had two gods in ancient times. Yahweh, the god of the living, Christ Jesus, Yahweh the Savior, that's what it means, is the one who is the god of the living. And you can only have life in Christ because in Christ and no one else there is life. But Osiris was the god of the dead. So the god of the dead was actually a god that concentrated on death rather than on life. And veneration of the dead was a system that is attributed to Osiris. So in this religious system you had the various deities and Osiris was the one who weighed you in the balances to see if you were found wanting. So he is also the one who is the judge. Now, in the biblical system, who is the one who is the judge? All judgment has given unto whom? Was given unto Jesus. Jesus is the judge. He's the God of the living. So Jesus says, if you are in me, you have nothing to fear. I am the judge. I'm the advocate. I'm everything rolled into one. Osiris is the one who weighs your works and sees whether your works, your good works, outweigh your bad works. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, well then you went to the good place. And if your bad works outweighed your good works, then you went to the bad place. So the teaching of a bad place on the other side and a good place on the other side is based on the Osiris cult. And we have to compare the two very, very carefully. So it was taught that Anubis, for example, this dog-like god, is another form of Osiris, the god of the dead. And when you died, he is the one who took you through the processes that occurred on the other side. So the pharaoh, when he died, his whole clan was put to death, his whole staff had to die with him, and they probably died quite happily because they were going through to the other side to serve in a much more exalted capacity than they served before. So they did have no fear. We have religions today where people are prepared to do all kinds of things to get into that state of bliss. Even blow themselves up just to get to that state of bliss. They have no knowledge of the teachings of the scriptures in this regard, or they would never do such a silly thing. <laughs> so after death, it was taught that life continues much as it does today without the burdens. And uh, you carried on in a blissful cloud nine situation. Now the veneration and the consultation of the dead is prohibited in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 says, There shall not be found amongst you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. Now, do religions today still do fireworks, yes or no? Yes, yes absolutely, just go to the east. And what about our religions in our world? What about Western society? Do you know that... Uh, in the education process in big industry today. Fireworks are very common as you have New Age mind trainers that train you for positions of authority within the business world and they take you through the fireworks constantly and uh, 
you overcome these fears. This is something that God forbids. Or that uses divination or the observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. It's great to be Harry Potter or his friends these days, right? To be a witch or a wizard. Or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Someone who consults the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. Wow! Now if you were so highly exalted and so spiritual and so close to God and so wonderful if you were dead, then why does God say you're not allowed to talk to any of these? or communicate with the spirit world on the other side? Why were you not allowed to be a wizard? Why were you not allowed to do these things? Why not? Because when you were dead, you were dead. Then who is acting the part of the living when you are really dead? Who is it then? It must be Satan, the deceiver, and demonic forces. So when you call upon the names of these deceased, you are calling up, the, not the spirits of the dead, you are calling up the spirits of demons. And they have no problem in impersonating those that went before. Anyone who came into contact with a dead person or a grave was considered unclean and could not take part in the temple worship. Now that does not mean that if someone died in the family, you could not bury him because they buried their dead. They buried Abraham, they buried Isaac, they buried Jacob. They carried the bones of Joseph back with them to the promised land. So it has nothing to do with burying your dead or something like that or paying last respects to someone who has, who has passed away or to show grief with those who are crying. It has to do with veneration. It has to do with worship. So God separated the worship systems that involved the dead as far as the east is from the west from his worship system. There was to be no question as to any veneration of the dead whatsoever. Whatsoever. It had to be totally separated. So God said, no one will come into my temple and worship over dead bodies. That doesn't mean you can't bury someone who has died. I'm not talking about that. It's talking about worship. And whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Numbers 19, 16. So you won't to come into contact with graves. Why was this so? Why did God make this very strong distinction? Because paganism believes in the veneration of the dead. In Africa, where I come from, all the great religions are based purely on the veneration of the dead. The ancestors are the ones through whom everyone is worshipped, including Christ. Catholicism fits like a glove into that situation because Catholicism teaches the veneration of the dead. There's Saint so-and-so and Saint so-and-so and Saint the other and Saint whoever. And you go through the saint to God. And now in the African system, you go through the ancestor to God. In the, in, the, in the Indian, in the Red Indian culture, you do exactly the same thing. It's based on paganism. That's all they know. So God made a very clear distinction and said, listen, there is no veneration of the dead. In fact, I don't want you to have anything to do with this. You cannot come into contact with these, with these entities of the dead and presume them to be active on your behalf, because they're dead. Dead is dead. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, There shall none be defiled for the dead amongst the people. Leviticus 21.1 Very, very clear distinctions. Very clear. But the world today 
does not believe in the death of the dead. They believe the lie that the devil spoke, and they believed in continued life after death, some in bliss, and those are the ones that you contact. The Bible says none of them, none of them. Contact with any one of them is akin to witchcraft, is akin to witchcraft. Now let's have a look at the cathedrals of the world today. The cathedrals of the world today are all built on ancient pagan worship sites. No cathedral may be without dead bodies and graves, or else it is not a cathedral. A cathedral is in fact a mortuary. It is a graveyard. And God said, you're not to come into contact with the graves of the dead when you come to worship Him. Stay away from the temple for seven days. You can grieve, that's fair enough, but don't come to my temple. I'm making a difference between paganism and the God of the living. I am not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Stay away from this, this issue. I am the God. Worship me. Don't worship through any dead man's bones. Well, the cathedrals are not only ancient pagan worship sites. All the great cathedrals, Notre Dame, St. Paul's, all of them, all those cathedrals are built on ancient pagan sites. And they were all built in exactly the same fashion as was the Druidic system. You used to have a channel of stones, huge pillar stones, leading up to a central circle in which was the central stone, which is the circle with the dot on it, the ancient pagan sexual symbol of unification between the two deities, the male and the female, and propagation of life through the fertility rite. It's pretty weird. Now the ancient cathedrals are built exactly the same way. These pillars that you have, the giant pillars in a cathedral represent those stones. And in the ancient cathedrals in the past, you always used to have a circular garden behind with a stone in the center, as in the Druidic system. And many of the cathedrals today still have that. So when you look down the passage, you used to come into the circle down the passage. These great pillars on the side represent the channel of the sun and they're built in that way as well. And you walk through and you walk through the regeneration cycle into the sexual occult setting of the circular grove where the hidden god, either Pan or the god of the woods, Diana, or one of them was situated. And as you walk down this aisle, you are walking on the bodies of men. It is necromancing. It is the age-old Druidic system. In fact, you are not allowed to say a mass in any, in any church setting in these religious systems without there being the bone of a dead saint under the altar. You have to have a bone because only through the dead man's bones or a portion of him, whatever the portion is, can you actually find access to God. Wow! That is something that God strictly forbade and something which is generally practiced today. So in the Druidic system, this is what you had. There you had the circular stone hedge. In the past there used to be the channel, the walkway of stones on either side. And then they covered it up on the sides. They put a steeple on the front. And that was the cathedral. It's built and based on Druidic worship of the ancestors of the dead. These are modern day Druids. And you will see that they are dressed very much like nuns. Interesting. Well, here is one of the great cathedrals in Europe. And you will see here is one of the circular gardens. This today placed on the side. And in it, when you go walking through it, you will find the graves and you will find the ancient sites. In the cathedrals, you will have numerous bodies of whoever it is. Kings and queens and dead people and saints and just anybody as long as there are lots of bodies, but largely important people. So here in these cathedrals you'll find all these graveyards, something which God strictly forbade. Here you have the tombs. This is Edward, the kings lying in state. 
who were the pine cones and all the regalia that deals with paganism. This particular one over here is the bone of a saint. Uh, I've been in many, many cathedrals and I've always wondered who is the particular saint that is under the altar? Because in the altar, where the Mass is said, you have particular bone structures. So here, for example, uh, this one comes from the cathedral in London, where under the altar, in the basement, you will find these tombs and these relics. And if you ever have the opportunity, then go into the basements and have a look for yourselves. You will find them there. There is not a church, a Roman Catholic church or an Anglican church or one of the paganized churches where you will not find these bones. And they will make them prominent as you enter into the churches. Here in this Roman Catholic cathedral, there's a giant tomb right there. You walk into the graveyard. Something that God said you should never do. Here is an interesting cathedral that I found in Germany. There's the symbol of the sun god, by the way. There is the altar. So either in the altar or under, directly under the altar, there will be a tomb. Now normally you don't see it from inside the church. You have to go looking outside the church for an entrance or a side entrance somewhere. But in this particular one, the entrance was right in the church. It just went down and then you can go under the altar and of course there has to be a tomb down there or else you cannot say the Mass because it's veneration of the dead. And I went down and stuck my camera through there just to show you the tomb. There it is and the altar is up there in the top. That's worship of the dead. Some nice tombs. This is in, in the cathedrals in London and in Europe, wherever you go. And then as you walk down the aisleways of these cathedrals, you will find that you are walking on dead men's bones all over the place. And this is John uh, Ghent, and he died on the 13th of August, 1767, and you will find others. Now, in the system, the God of the dead was either Seb in the Egyptian system, and later he became Saturn, the Saturn God. And the symbol of Saturn was the skull with the two bones, which is also the symbol, of course, that pirates use. And that is the symbol of the God of the dead. But that's not the symbol of Jesus Christ. This is a Roman Catholic cathedral in Europe. At the top there, you have the phoenix. This is a symbol of Lucifer. That's not a symbol of Jesus Christ. And there, you have Anubis. They don't even hide it. Anubis, the God of the dead, the God of the Egyptian dead. So choose, are we serving the God of the dead or are we serving the God of the living? Either one or the other. Now what about Catholicism in general, the Pope amongst us? The Bened beatification of Father Joseph Gerard, just as a modern day example, when a human being is uh, beatified, declared to be a saint, and you'll be surprised at who is declared to be a saint. Anybody who does something for Rome is declared to be a saint. They're discussing the beatification of Konrad Adenauer now, so wow, soon you'll be able to pray to him too. Well, in any case, here again is the symbol of the sun in front of him. And in Catholicism, the veneration of the dead is very, very prominent. That's why the ancient pagan religions associate readily with Catholicism. In this particular monastery, here are the bones and the skeletons of all the monks that have ever lived throughout the ages of Catholicism in this particular monastery. Here, when you died, you didn't get buried. You were set aside for a while until you were cleaned up. And then uh, you became part of the decoration. And when you go into this place, it is claimed that you can benefit from their righteous works. Because in their lives, these monks con um, did more righteous works than they needed to go to heaven. So there's an excess of righteousness. There's sort of a basin out of which you can take a little bit to top up your lack of righteousness. And I'm not making a joke, this is Catholic doctrine. I know, I'm a Catholic, I was a Catholic myself. I was a Catholic. Here you go. 
take some of this righteousness. Walk through there and pray to the dead. Here are all the bones and the skulls standing over there at Ger Capucci in Rome. Well, this is bringing the ancestors to Mass. Priests say they are tired of being black sheep of clerical family and want African rituals included in their services. Well, that's what's happening all over the world and in Africa in particular. And the ancient ancestral form of worship is alive and back today as it was in the beginning. So you can pray to these saints, you can ask for them to mediate, and you can borrow from their excess righteousness to top up yours. And Jesus Christ, who is the only mediator between man and God, is marginalized. You never talk to him. You know, you have to have a special audience through all these dead men's bones to get there. Now, when you go to Islam, it's exactly the same religion. Islam is also the veneration of the dead. And it is exactly the same as Catholicism in this sense. That's why behind the scenes there is no problem between the religions. This is the famous Umayyad mosque in Syria, the oldest mosque. By the way, this is the mosque that the Pope chose to make his um, apology for all the deeds that uh, happened in the past in the name of religion. And uh, I stood in this mosque and I was stunned to see what was going on here. Here you can see the Muslims praying at this particular shrine. This is a fascinating shrine. Because in this particular shrine here in the Umdayat Mosque, there lies the body of an interesting personage. And in fact, it's not the whole body, it's just the head of that particular entity that is here somewhere buried under one of these pillars and that's what makes the mosque a place of worship. Uh, any guesses as to whose head is in that mosque? John the Baptist. Now you might be stunned to hear that John the Baptist, who is revered by Christians, should be here in this mosque revered by Muslims and finding special grace from the head of John the Baptist. Well, the Pope was here and also paid special homage, of course, to this particular skull in there. I don't know whether it really is the head of John the Baptist. Fortunately, the Roman Catholic Church is not totally devoid of this luxury because they have the arm of John the Baptist in one of their cathedrals in Istanbul, you see. So between the two of them, maybe they can find some of the rest of the pieces as well, I don't know. But isn't it sad to have this ritual of praying to the dead? For dust thou art, and dust unto dust thou shalt return. Genesis 3.19. In Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So all mankind that was in Adam is subject to death. That's the bottom line. And death is non-life. You're dead. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. It returns to God. It's not the entity, it's the ruach, the breath, the life-giving principle which returns to God, and then you cease to live. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. All the while, let's read what happens here. Job 27, verse 3. All the while, my breath is in me. And the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. That is Hebrew parallelism. That equates the breath with the Spirit as one. In other words, he's saying, this is the situation, this is the situation. Repeating it in other words. So Hebrew parallelism, as we have seen also in the concordance, equates this life-giving principle, the Spirit, with the breath, the life-giving principle of God. All the while, my breath, this life-giving principle, the fact that I breathe, means that I am alive, 
and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. This breath is in my nostrils. That is why I'm alive. If God should take this breath, this life-giving principle away from me, what happens to me? I'm dead. I die. Listen to this. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. The soul, nefesh, that sinneth, it shall die. So people say, ha ha, I die, but my soul remains alive. No, no, no. The soul is the entity that is alive, that is the body plus the, the Ruach, plus the spirit. And when I die in sin, I die. The soul, the nefesh, the living entity, dies. It ceases to exist. So the soul is not a separate entity that goes and sits on cloud nine and plays the harp. I always thought that was going to be terribly boring to one day die and sit on a cloud and play the harp. And uh, when I was for a while completely away from the church and went through my atheistic stance and then back to the church again, these issues always fascinated me. The King James Version uses the word soul 1,600 times but never once uses the term immortal soul. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Only God is immortal. The Bible declares that death is asleep 53 times. Of course you are asleep when you are in Christ because Christ is the God of the living. So when you die, the Bible says, if you are in Christ, you are as though you are just asleep. God will wake you up at the latter day. Let's see what happens when you die. But a man dieth, and wasteth away. Yea, a man giveth up the ghost, the ruach, the spirit. And where is he? Job 14 verse 10. But man dies and is cut off. That is the New King James Version of the same text. And man expires. And where is he? You see this word ghost over there? Is the word expires. It's a very good translation. So Look carefully at your translations. The word expire means to breathe your last. Isn't that right? He breathes his last. So the breath goes from him. The life principle goes from him. Hebrews, chava, die, give up the ghost, dead, perish, expire, be about to die. That's what it means. And how long will he remain in that state? Job 14 verse 12, Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. That's the teaching of the Bible. So when you die, it is akin to a state of sleep for how long? Until the heavens are no more. And when will that take place, by the way? The Bible says that when Christ returns, the heavens will roll up like a scroll. So at the return of Christ there is an awakening from the sleep. So you die, you know nothing, you sleep until the resurrection day. You will not awake nor will you be raised from that sleep. Let's have a look at the practical example that Jesus left behind. John 11 verse 11. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a friend of Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Now the disciples thought, well this man is talking about a sick Lazarus who is asleep. Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but Jesus called it a sleep. But they thought, he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. See, Lazarus is dead, but for Christ, Lazarus was what? Asleep. Asleep. Because Christ is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So, here he was, he was asleep. Now what about Abraham? To Christ, Abraham is what? Sleeping. That's what it's all about. So Lazarus is dead, but to Christ 
he was just asleep. God does not forget the dead. They are in Christ. He has the hard disk. He has the full record of your entity as you were. And when he says, restore, there you are. Perfect. Like you were. Better. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. John eleven twenty one. 21. So now when Jesus comes to Lazarus, he's confronted by Mary, who says, if only you'd been here, he would not have died. Thy brother shall rise again, John eleven twenty three. 23. Jesus comforts her and says, What's your problem? Don't you have faith? Your brother will rise again. Let's listen to her answer. She answers, John eleven twenty four. 24, I know that he is now in heaven, and one day he will come again and return to his body at the resurrection. Is that what it says there? No. No. It says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So what is the biblical teaching about death? The biblical teaching about death is you die and it's a state of sleep, total unconsciousness, but Christ will raise you on the latter day and to show that he had power over death, he raised Lazarus from the dead. But Lord, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days, John eleven thirty nine. 39. But he said to him, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out and said, Lord, why did you call me up? I was having such fun in heaven. Not a word. Not a word. Lazarus continued with his life. He, as if he had woken out of a sleep. There's no question that he was not in heaven or anywhere else during that time period. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. 2 Samuel 7 verse 12. To Daniel, he said, read the last verse of Daniel. He says, Daniel, you shall sleep and you shall rise again in the latter days to receive your allotted inheritance. They're all asleep in Christ. Is there a conscious existence after death? We have to answer this question. It's very important. Well, Psalms 146.4 says, His breath, this ruach, this life-giving principle, the Spirit of God returns to God, goes forth, forth, returneth to His earth. In that very day, His thoughts perish. So when you die, there's no thinking, no cognitive thought. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6. So when we are told there's a haunted house over there, and it's haunted because the guy who lived over there had an affair with so-and-so and so-and-so, and then they killed each other, and now the place is haunted because they're constantly bickering and fighting and are envious about the relationships that they had prior to that. Is that biblical or is it unbiblical? It's totally unbiblical. Totally unbiblical. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. So when Prince Charles of England consults Lord Mountbatten, who is dead, who's he talking to? He's not talking to Lord Mountbatten. He might think so. But my Bible says that Lord Mountbatten won't help him anything because his thoughts have perished. He's not there. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalms 115, 17. So when you die, people say, that person is now in heaven, in the presence of God, praising God. No, not so. Psalms 115, 17 says, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. There's nothing down there. Nothing. Just silence. For in death, there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? Psalm 6 verse 5. Nobody. 
You cannot praise God after you're dead. If you want to praise God, you have to praise Him now. You won't get a second chance later. There's no purgatory where you can burn off some of your venial sins to find better favor with God. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beasts. There's no difference between the way an animal dies and man dies. It says, that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beast. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. So animals and man die the same way. They all have one breath. One breath. Now many churches teach that people when they die go to heaven, but animals don't because they don't have a soul. That's not biblical. There's the Bible text. And the Bible may not contradict itself. Everybody dies the same way. That animal has exactly the same metabolism as any human being. Any scientist can tell you that. I can transplant an animal's organ and put it into a human being, and if we can get rid of the problem of rejection, they'll probably survive. So there's no difference between the way an animal lives and the way a human lives. The only difference is that a human makes cognitive decisions in his life, and is subject to the reckoning of God, and therefore in Christ or out of Christ. So animals die the same way as humans. They all have one spirit, ruach, life-giving principle, so that man has no preeminence over a beast. Isn't that interesting? We must read the Bible carefully. Isaiah 38, 18, there is beautiful harmony throughout the Bible. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The decision has to be made now, not like later. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Ecclesiastes 9.10 So when you are dead, you are dead. If you want to do something, do it now. If you want to make right with someone you've had a problem with, do it now. You can't do it later. You can't come back as a ghost and sort it out and fight forever and ever and talk about haunted houses and whatever. That's demology. That's spiritism. Imagine how much confusion could be avoided if people accepted the biblical doctrine on death. What a wonderful relief. I was so relieved when I heard that my mother was asleep. And I have confidence that one day she will rise in Christ. I have confidence in that. My mother didn't know all the truth, but I know that God will judge her according to what she knew. My mother died when I was 12 years old. And I was always worried when I did bad things that, oh, wow, Mom, I'm sorry, please close your eyes that you can't see this. Now I know my mother's asleep. What a relief. She doesn't have to worry about me and freak out and panic on the other side whether I'm going to do this right, that right, or the other wrong. She's asleep. And one day I'll have a nice chat to her when the Lord ra rise, raises her from the dead. That is my hope. This is an old joke, but it's still quite funny. Paul Adams, 1902, stop my friend as you go by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be, so prepare yourself to follow me. To follow you, I am not content until I know just where you went. <laughs> well, it's quite cute. What about this now? This is the birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon the site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox Sisters. And this is their stone, their mortuary stone, March 31, 1848. There is no death, there are no dead. Is that God language or serpent language? It's serpent language. Very interesting. There they are, the three fox sisters. They're the ones that started modern spiritism because they heard the rappings. And they would tap, 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 tap. And then the spirits would tap, 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 tap. And so the communication, the modern communication with the spirit world opened up to the Western world. 
Of course, in the ancient cultures, it had always been there, in the African culture, in the Egyptian culture, in the Babylonian culture, in the Eastern culture. Consultation with the dead was always practiced. But for the modern Western Christian mind, this was the opening wedge. Spiritualism says that the dead know more than the living. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, Genesis 3 verse 4. Spiritism says, you know more, you know more. In this, this is now quoting them, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. E. W. Sprague, spiritualist. Wow! So the Lord lied, and the Lord was in error, and the devil is the one who is the truth. That's great. Spiritism claims that the dead are not dead. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that the human beings survive bodily death, and that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. This is J. Arthur Hill, Spiritism, History, Phenomena and Doctrine, page 25. So they say, you're not dead. The Bible says you're dead. Well, one of the two is wrong, right or wrong. One of the two is wrong. Spiritism claims that the dead communicate with the living. There is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I frequently talk with them, Sir Oliver Lodge. Wow. In fact, Spiritism is alive and practiced at the highest levels of society today. At the highest levels of society. Kings and queens and emperors and presidents, they all practice it. Very interesting. Something which the Bible forbids. The progressive thinker, May 18, 1929, said, What spiritualism is and does, it removes all fear of death which is really the portal to the spirit world. This is Eastern mysticism, this is Osiris worship, this is Anubis. It teaches that death is not the cessation of life, but a mere change of condition. Spiritualism is God's message to mortals declaring, there is no death. That all who have passed on still live. That there is hope in the life beyond for the most sinful. Ah! So carry on sinning, it doesn't matter, you can fix it up later. That's interesting. That every soul will progress through the ages to heights sublime and glorious, where God is love and love is God. And I always say, look at India, look at Calcutta, how thousands of years of reincarnation has improved the quality of life there. It's ridiculous. It's the most pathetic lie in the universe, and the devil spun it, and the world believes it. That's the fact of the matter. As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so he who goes down to the grave does not return. He will never come to his house again. Job 7, verse 9 and 10. You cannot talk with the dead, because the dead no, not anything. If you talk to the dead, you are talking to a demon who says, I am who I am. I've got types of these. My father-in-law was deeply steeped into spiritualism. He was a very prominent New Ager. He believed all this stuff. I can tell you stories that you will not believe. Don't miss the lecture tomorrow night. The New Age Movement. Wow! His sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not. What do we preach at the graveside? They're looking down upon you. Don't be sad. And they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. Job 14, 21. What comfort! My mother never saw my, my mistakes and my bad moves or, or whatever. She's asleep. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. Job 16, 22. Until the Lord comes, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. Whap! There goes reincarnation. Goodbye. Either you believe the Bible, 
or you believe the lie. One of the two. There is no reincarnation. There is no cycle. There is no second chance. It's now or never. You are appointed once to die, and then there is a resurrection, and it's judgment, whether we like it or not. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, they peep and they mutter, they make funny noises. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? What are you doing consulting the dead? Isaiah 8, 19. Talk to God. Don't consult the dead. Don't consult the stars and the spiritists and the wizards and the necromancers. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 20. If they do not speak according to the Bible, forget about them. Forget about them. They're lying. So spiritism and death are in unity, but God and life are in unity. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, Leviticus 19.31. Maybe Harry Potter movies are pleasant to some, but they plant seeds in young minds which ripen to make fruits of unrighteousness. Spirit entities coming out of the class, howling through the places, good spirits, bad spirits, good witches, bad witches. What a load of rubbish. And our kids are doing these things and doing them where? In church even. Can you believe it? Leviticus 19.31 Put not your trust in princes, nor in the sons of man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, his ruach, his life, returneth to his earth, goes back to dust, and that very day his thoughts perish. 146, 3 and 4. So it was the ancient Egyptians that believed the pagan doctrine of immortality of the soul. And they taught this fervently in Alexandria. Now do you know what's interesting? That the Jews were just like people today. They thought they could get a better education at the universities of the world. So they went to study the theology of the nations. And many of them received their education in Alexandria. The Sadducees were such a class. The Sadducees believed that when you died, you went straight to heaven. And there you sat on Abraham's lap. How comfortable it was. And if you had something to pray about, you prayed to Abraham, who was dead, to communicate to God. That's ancestral worship. You pray through Abraham to God. You use an in-between one. And they taught, as they learnt here in Egypt, in Alexandria, that when you died, you went either to the good place or you went to the hot place. That's Inubis Osiris worship. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in what? They believed in the death and the resurrection. And when Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin, because it's surprising what bedfellows you find when you are opposing God. When it came to opposing Christ, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were in perfect harmony with each other. Buddies, bedfellows. And when Paul was confronted later, he was in a bit of trouble there, so he threw this gauntlet at them. And he says, I am a Pharisee. I believe in the resurrection. And <laughs> remember what happened there? They started fighting so much amongst themselves, they didn't even know what to do with Paul anymore. It's interesting. So this is what the ancient Egyptians believed. So ancestor worship, in most cases, is simply spiritualism of the East which serves as the exponent of immortality. Contact with the other world, page 14. That's what its bottom line is. And he doeth great wonder and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. Revelation 13. Spiritualism is going to play a major role in the deceptions of the last days. I will show you slides that will stun you 
in lecture that's coming up called Signs and Wonders. Don't miss it. For they are spirits of devils working miracles. Revelation 16, 14. When Mary appears to the Christian Catholic world, or to the Islamic world as she frequently, in inverted commas, does. Who's appearing? Mary's asleep. Mary's asleep awaiting the resurrection, so who's appearing? It's a demon masquerading as Mary. And no mar marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of life. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. The devil assumes the role of Christ. He comes as Matreya, and says, I am your brother who through many cycles have done this and that and the other and what have you. What a load of nonsense! If he's so great because he had so many cycles, then everybody is great according to that doctrine because everybody had the same amount of cycles, right? Why should he then be better than the others? But they're all dead. None of them live. So they are demonic. Satan and Mary appearances, exactly the same. Or Gaia appearances, or Vishnu, or Siva, or Lord who, ever. All one and the same. Matthew 7, 22, 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from you, ye that work iniquity, anomia, against the Lord of the law of God. Ephesians says in 6.11, put on the whole armor of God. You cannot just believe bits and pieces of the Bible. You've got to take the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If a spirit being walks in here now and claims to be Jesus Christ, as has happened in Mexico when thousands of people fell down at a football stadium where he appeared and worshipped him. Hello? Who's appearing there? If you want to stand against these strange manifestations, then we must be armed with the Bible. Well, some people say, what about the thief on the cross? Jesus said to him, you will be with me in heaven. Let's go through this carefully. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. Luke 23, 42. That day was the Friday. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. So you see, the thief was with Christ in heaven on the day that he died. Well, it depends where you put that comma. Because that comma was not there in the original text. In fact, the space between the words was not even there in the original text. It was one big block. So, it could also read, if you shift the comma to there, to there, Verily I say unto thee today, Shalt thou be with me in paradise, or you shalt be with me in paradise. So now we have to ask the question, Jesus, was the thief with you? After his death on that day, the Friday, was he with you in paradise? Yes or no? Well, firstly, he couldn't have been because he wasn't dead yet. Because the Bible says that they, when the Sabbath was drawing close to a close, uh, they were saying to the, to the Romans, you better check these guys, they're still alive. So they went to what, do what with their bones? Break their bones, but when they came to Christ, he was already dead. Now they broke the bones so that they couldn't climb down from the cross on a Sabbath because it would have been a sacrilege to chase them on a Sabbath day, you see. They would be breaking the Sabbath. So break their bones and they can't do that. So firstly, he wasn't dead on the Sabbath. He still lived past that. And secondly, he wasn't in heaven. Jesus did not ascend to heaven on the day of his crucifixion. He slept in the grave. Let's check that out. Mary Magdalene comes to the grave Sunday morning. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So he couldn't have been with the thief in heaven, because he had not ascended to his Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So early on the first day of the week, Jesus ascended unto heaven. He wasn't there on that Friday. 
And that evening he was back because he appeared amongst the disciples. So on that day he went to the Father and the Father accepted his sacrifice. So the thief was not with Christ in heaven on that day. So Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you today, you will be with me in heaven. God does not forget the dead. If a man die, shall he live again all the days of appointed time? Will I wait till my change come? Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. Job 14, 14 and 15. So he will die, he will sleep, and Christ desires, he longs to be with his people. He cannot wait for the day of the resurrection. So the dead sleep in Christ, and on the day of the resurrection, Jesus says, Come forth, I'm here. And they wake up. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ's, when? At his coming. Now the Bible says that there was a wave offering, a first fruits offering. Now when Christ rose from the dead, there was an earthquake, or when he died, there was an earthquake. And what happened? Graves opened, and the dead rose. Certain select dead rose, and those dead are the first fruits of the resurrection and are with Christ in heaven. So some are in heaven already. Then there are a few others that are in heaven as well. Enoch never died. He went to heaven. He was translated. Elijah, he didn't die. He was translated and went to heaven. Moses died but was resurrected because the book of Jude says that there was contention over him. And Elijah, Moses, Enoch and a number of others who serve as priests together with Christ because they were 24 elders together, 25 elders together with Christ in, uh, or in the earthly sanctuary and so there are also elders serving in the courts above. So some are alive. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. We will be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Psalm 17:15. Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. So it's not a ghost. I will see him as I am. Wonderful thoughts. According to the Lord's own word, this is all scripture, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, so when the Lord comes, there will be the living who are in Christ, and there will be the dead who are asleep in Christ, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16. After that, we who are still alive, so the living at the end of time, and our left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The clouds, Hebrew parallelism, I'll de deal with it in a later lecture, are angels. So the angels gather the elect and they meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 So that's the biblical teaching. Christ returns, the dead in Christ are raised, the living are translated, together the one not preceding the other meet the Lord in the air. We shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up, then I shall rise in a moment and be happy with him forever. The Christian Hope, page 37, that's what Martin Luther taught. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in, 
in that which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. John 5, 28, 29. And he that has the Son, he will have life. And he that does not have the Son of God, he will not have life. We will have to deal with this very carefully. 1 John 5, 12. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1, 17. God is immortal. Not we. We have immortality by grace. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and onwards. So we see that the Bible is consistent throughout on this topic. These all died in their faith not having received the promises. Paul lists a whole list of great men and he says they died without having received the promises. But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews 11:13. The promise of the earth made new is coming in the future. The dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust, for the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah 26, 19. The biblical doctrine is so clear. I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11:25. So here are these two great distinctions. Now what about the texts in the Bible where it talks about hyena, hellfire, all of these interesting things. What happens to the wicked? What happens to them? What is all this about? Revelation 6, 16 and 17. And he said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the one class, the dead in Christ rise, the living righteous are translated, together they meet the Lord in the air. There's another class, the living wicked, and the dead wicked. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the nefesh, the living entity, but rather fear him which is able to destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. Doctrine of hell? Well, the word used there is chiena. Chiena. What does it mean? Let's have a look at it. Chiena. The Hebrew origin, hell, is the place of future punishment called Chiena or Chiena of fire. This was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and the dead animals of the city were cast out and burnt, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. So there you have this concordance explanation of this word. So the word refers to the valley where the dead bodies were burnt, destroyed. By the way, how long did those bodies burn? Until they were gone. Until they were burnt, gone. Now the Greek, Hades, and the Hebrew, Shoal, which is used in the Bible and which is often referred to as hell, for the doctrine of hell, is the place of the dead, so it's the grave. You go down into the pit, you go down into Shoal, into the grave. You go down into Hades, the grave. And it's often translated also as hell. So here you have the two possibilities for this doctrine of hell. The one is Chena, this fire that burns, which was a symbol of this valley of Hinnon. And the other one is Hades, or Shoal. Then he shall say unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed it, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. Now what is this everlasting fire? 
These are the symbols that are used to explain the doctrine of hell. Now this is what Samuel Hopkins wrote, Catholic doctrine is the following. The smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever in the sight of the blessed before their eyes. This display of the divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed. Aha! So Catholic doctrine says that if those burning down there, the contrast between the redeemed and those burning is very great and is in favor of the redeemed. And most entertaining. Interesting. And give the highest pleasure to those who love God. That'll be great. So if I have my daughter or my son or one of them down there, this will give me the greatest pleasure while I sit in heaven and watch them sizzle fits. It's kind of sick. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would be in a great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. That's a very warped idea of blessing and happiness. It's a pretty sick idea. So this idea of the eternally damned and the eternally blessed is a, is a heavy Roman Catholic concept. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in them dying, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God is not this character that is portrayed there. I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. Ezekiel 18.32 This is a sword in the heart of this Catholic doctrine. Catholic religion, Martin, page 290, the Council of Trent decided, in purgatory the souls can themselves wipe wipe their debt only by suffering. So here he's taught another sort of in-between station. You have hell, or you have eternal torment, but if you weren't so bad, you could burn off some of, your, some of your sins beforehand. Either God forgives you or He doesn't. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will partly pardon. Isaiah 55, 7, is that right or not? abundantly pardon. As far as the east is from the west, he will remove your sins from you. There's no halfway station where you need a blowtorch to burn off the rest that wasn't perfected. So the doctrine of purgatory is not biblical either. So what about the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Well, we've already explained. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees taught that when you died, you went straight to heaven or straight to hell. That was Alexandrian doctrine. That's where they received their training. And, by the way, they also, as we said, taught that they were going to the lap of Abraham. And now Jesus takes their story and he turns it upside down. They also taught that if you were great and good and wonderful on this earth, and if you were one of the elect, born into the elect society, you went phew, straight to the to Abraham's lap. Well, Jesus takes their doctrine and he takes everything they stand for and turns it upside down. The rich man goes to the bad place. He stands for Israel, who had all this knowledge. And the poor man, who had nothing but sores, the sinful one, who waited for the crumbs, the little bit of doctrine that could fall from the table of Israel. He received nothing. He went to Abraham's lap. And the ones then down there, he said, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, please, can I not just send someone a message that uh, my brothers can be warned? Now, what is wrong with that story? People make that a literal story. Firstly, all the redeemed on Abraham's lap, that's not biblical. Secondly, He's praying, asking Father Abraham to do something for him. That's veneration of the dead. So all those doctrines in that parallel strike directly at the heart of Sadduceal teaching and kills it. This is a story that turns the doctrine of the Sadducees upside down and shows them the bigotry of that story. That the wicked is reserved to the day of, what does it say there? Destruction. 
They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Job 21, 30. In the Bible, you must put the texts together and let the plain texts explain the not-so-plain ones. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now the question is, is the punishment going to continue forever and ever, or is the consequence of the punishment eternal? That is the question we must answer. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Aha! So the first death is the one that you die, literally when you die. Then you can be raised to judgment. And the lake of fire is the second death. So you die a second time. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which is what? The second death. So how long will the wicked burn? Is it an everlasting suffering, or is the consequence everlasting? But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs, they shall consume into smoke, they shall consume away. Psalms 37, 20. Now the Bible says, they will be burnt and burn away. So the consequences of the fire, of the hyena, just like those animals died out there and were burnt, or those that had burnt, burnt away until there were no more, they will be destroyed, they will burn, and they consume away. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, Revelation 29. So they will be consumed away. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Malachi 4.1 They shall burn away. Examples in the Bible? Turning to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example, example, unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, they suffered the consequences of eternal fire. Did the fire burn eternally, or are the consequences eternally in terms of Sodom and Gomorrah? Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning out there? No. But it's gone for how long? Forever. That's the Hebrew concept of extet. Forever, forever. The concept is that the consequence is forever. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, this is Jude 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It's an example of the eternity of that judgment. They shall be as though they had not been, Abadiah 16. In other words, the wicked will one day perish and be gone. God does not burn them forever and ever and ever. How incredibly unjust that would be for a short life of wrongdoing to be eternally tormented. That's not the character of God. That's the character of another one. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible is distorted into teaching that, but it doesn't teach that. And you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be what? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. So here's the bottom line. If you have Christ, you rise in the resurrection. If you are alive when He comes, you will be translated together with the righteous. They meet the Lord in the air and they live for how long? Forever. In Christ there is life. Without Christ there is 
no life, there is death. You will rise, you will be judged, you will know why you will not have eternal life. Fire comes down from heaven, you suffer the torment of Chiena, that is being extinguished, just like that, gone. For how long? Forever. Forever. And you shall trample the wicked, there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 4 third. What happens to Satan? Does he live forever? Are we ever and ever and ever going to be reminded of the wickedness and the sadness of this planet? No, Ezekiel 28, 18, 19 says, Will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, talking about Satan, it shall devour thee and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee, and never shalt thou be any more. Is that clear? It's so plain, but it can be readily distorted if you want to. And the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. This earth is going to be cleansed by fire, Peter 3.10. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. One chance. You have this life to make a decision. And at the end of this life, you are either in Christ or you are not in Christ. If you are in Christ, you have life. If you, have not, if you are not in Christ, you don't have life. They shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John 5, 29. Is that plain? I think it's very plain. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put an incorruption, this mortal immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 to 54. <coughs> and then, once sin has been removed, sinners have been removed, Demons have been removed forever. God recreates the planet. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21.1 And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21.4 So rather than being in heaven and seeing the wicked burn for all eternity, so that you can be delighted by their suffering, there's no such sick doctrine in the Bible. That's a doctrine of paganism, and it comes all the way from Babylon, and is taught in the world and believed in the world by virtually every religious system, including mainline Christianity. And mainline Christianity has gone so far as to bring in pagan incrustations so that in the cathedrals of the world you are walking into pagan temples of death. The worship of Anubis is not the worship of Christ. The two are mutually exclusive. And Christ promises that even if you are sad, there will be tears right up until this moment. Christ will wipe the tears of your eyes. And then there will be peace and happiness and no more sin on this planet. That's the biblical teaching on death. Now tomorrow, we can deal with the New Age movement. And then we can look at these fantastic manifestations that we have today. I will show you videos tomorrow. I will show you things that you probably never heard of before. And I will show you things as to who these people actually worship because they mention him by name. 
And I'm not talking about Mickey Mouse people. I'm talking about the prominent people of this world. Don't miss tomorrow's lectures. And come and look at the deception that Satan has prepared for the last days. But if you believe what was on the screen tonight and what was in the Bible, you will see the deception for what it is. May the Lord bless you as you ponder these things. And even if you couldn't fully grasp it all, come again tomorrow and let us look at the deceptions. We're going into the events of the last days now. These are going to be thunderous lectures. Thank you for coming. God bless you.